at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, if it's on our shelves, it's history. I'm better looking in person. This is a forgery for the real thing come to the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago. Welcome to Virtual Book Signing. I'm Daniel Weinberg, and we're here at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, as always, here in Chicago. A gorgeous day out there. We should be out there, but it's tough to get the camera and lighting outside on Chicago Avenue. Uh, but we did have a few people come in today to join us, which is very nice. Right off the bat, I want to thank Max Daniels, Lincoln presenter Max Daniels, our senior partner, uh, for doing those wonderful vignettes that you saw. Hope you enjoyed them. We have a bunch more that he did, and we'll trot them out every once in a while, but uh, he did a great job. You know, I think Lincoln himself might have enjoyed that. You know, he was a jokester as well. Maybe I, that's not new to all of you. Uh, so today, we're going to, uh, going to be talking about Lincoln's image in our culture, in the popular culture and in other areas as well. So we may as well just start out right now and show you a book that's coming out very soon uh, called Abraham Lincoln, Public Enemy Number One. A bit about what it is, uh, quickly, John Wilkes Booth shoots Lincoln with a bullet cursed by the notorious Chicken Man, a loco voodoo practitioner. And instead of killing Lincoln, the bullet puts the president into a coma for 68 years, his body remaining limber and ageless. When he awakens in 1933, Lincoln is a man out of time, a revered icon, and a political pariah. And Lincoln is on the run, a fugitive from justice. Uh, one of the things that happens in here, it seems, is that he ends up as a hostage uh, to the infamous bank robber John Dillinger here in Chicago. And, but Dillinger takes a liking to Lincoln and invites him to join his gang. Well, I don't want to tell you the ending. You're going to need to read this <laughs> to know what happens. I haven't read it yet either, so I'm kind of curious as to whether Lincoln may still be alive and lurking here in Chicago. So anyway, here we are again with uh, one of our favorite authors, Fred Reed, lifelong journalist, author or editor of more than a dozen books, including his award-winning Civil War and Case Stamps, He's won numerous literary awards from the American Numismatic Association, Society of Paper Money Collectors, the Numismatic Literary Guild, and many others. Has published a classic overachiever. He's published numerous articles in the Lincoln Herald, the Banknote Reporter, Coins Magazine, Coin World, Paper Money, uh, which he's been an editor and publisher for over a decade. Uh, and he's had his displays of his, his collections, large exhibits on Lincoln, and several Memphis International Paper Money Shows. And now we have uh, two must books. One, he was here before, the, uh, and you can go back and watch this on the archive at Virtual Book Signing. This was Abraham Lincoln, The Image of His Greatness, with a foreword by Thomas Turner. It's a Whitman publishing title, 272 pages, 2995. And this we have here, and we'll have some, if you'd like to, if you have not, uh, gotten the first book and you want this as the set, uh, it's a wonderful set to have, and I think this belongs in every Lincoln bookshelf, both of these, and you'll see why as the program goes on. So today, his newest, latest book, Abraham Lincoln, Beyond the American Icon, a forward by Q. Davis, David Bowers, is 447 pages, but still 29.95. Coins, stamps, tokens, metals, stocks, bonds, paper money, Paintings, comics, bookshops, advertisements, cartoons, movie stills, statuary, products like syrup and root beer, pens, patches, hat tacks, Lincoln presenters, magazine covers, dust jackets, highways. Is there no end to Lincoln imagery? No end. <laughs> no end in sight. <laughs> Tell us, how again did you, first of all, get to Lincoln? I got to Lincoln the way a lot of people get to Lincoln, through the Lincoln Scent. I was born in 1948, and in 1955, I, when I was seven years old, I started collecting Lincoln pennies, 
out of circulation, putting, putting them in Whitman folders, Whitman blue folders. And that was my first introduction to Lincoln. But, but I really became a Lincoln fan during the Civil War centennial. I was a teenager, I was in high school, I was interested in history, and I became very interested in Abraham Lincoln. I just want to very quickly just thumb through this so you have an idea of what this book looks like, uh, opening up to just various pages as they're going to come up. And we'll show some of these maybe later on. But you're going to see innumerable artifacts of various sorts. I think I just named a few of them. And it goes throughout the book like this with wonderful captions that uh, tell the story of what we're seeing. And of course, paper money is something you've, you're most interested in. Uh, is this book, the expanded, these two books, uh, the expanded answer to the article you wrote for the paper money uh, publication in 2006, the question was, did Lincoln's icon image on money influence his public perception? Yeah, that was, that was the short version of my argument. This is the extended version of my argument. I found in studying Lincoln images, I own nearly 5,000 Lincoln objects that have his image on it in one way or another. And I found that if you put them chronologically, if you were to put them all up on a wall, for example, and, and put the 1860s images and the 1870s images and the 1880s images right up until the present, the predominant image in every decade is the image of Lincoln on the money. And why is that? That's because money is mass media. In the 19th century, they had magazines that sold, or illustrated newspapers that sold maybe 100,000 at the most, but you had notes with his image on it in the millions, and then in the hundreds of millions, and then in the billions. And every time one of these notes passed hands in, in commercial commerce, you got image of Abraham Lincoln. And that kind of inculcated his image in the, in the uh, culture and the, the society. Well, you have innumerable uh, images of money and stocks and bonds. Um, are most of those from your own collection? Most of them are, yes, Dan. And uh, what was the first image of Lincoln on any money of any sort, coin or paper? In, in 1861, in, during the first administration, the Treasury Department um, decided that they needed a vehicle to be able to finance the war. All of a sudden, they had unprecedented expenditures. And Congress passed uh, bond legislation, and upon Congress passed Treasury noted uh, legislation. And on both the bonds and the Treasury notes, they put images of the political figures of the day as a, as a patriotic gesture and, and to show the people that the people in Washington knew what they were doing and here was money and it represented value and they would, the government would stand behind it. So in 1861 the first ten dollar bills were circulated and they had an image of Abraham Lincoln that was engraved by an engraver for the American Bank Note Company which contracted with the Treasury Department to produce the bills. His name was Charles Burt and he in fact over time created four images that appeared on U.S. paper money. So was the public bamboozled by uh, for the government showing Lincoln and saying, we know what we're doing? Um, evidently not. He was successful and won the war and they paid off their debts. <laughs> now, in these two books, you say that they look at the myth-making uh, being a survey of Lincoln consciousness from then until now. Uh, you divide the book into five periods. The Lincoln from 1809 to 65, his lifetime. Then Lincoln the Ideal from 1865 to 1909, the centennial. Uh, then Lincoln the Idol, 1909 to 1959. Then Lincoln the Icon, 59 to 09, the bicentennial. And then Lincoln the Immortal from 2009 and beyond, what I showed at the beginning and, right. and beyond. Tell us how you got into these periods and why, how did you make those time periods? Well, chr chronologically they make sense because you've got the discrete period of time that he walked the earth and the uh, interactions that he had with people and the images that were created during that time. And then you had a dramatic event. He was the first president who was assassinated. And after his assassination, all the people who had been his political enemies suddenly became his bosom buddies. There was very little ill to say about Lincoln after his um, assassination, where before his assassination he was reviled by many people. 
Yeah, you were charred and feathered if you said anything bad about him after the assassination. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Even his political enemies had good things to say about him. Even even the foreign press, even Punch Magazine, which had published cartoon after cartoon after cartoon after cartoon, lambasting him and ridiculing him and, and showing him as a country bumpkin and, and not uh, not capable of leading a great country like the English could, um, came, came around and became... Uh, a memorial expositor of his greatness, I guess you could say. Anyway, that period extended up until the centennial, and, and uh, that period was a period in our history of Republican administrations and Republican myth building. They would wave the bloody flag, and they would talk about uh, how they uh, won the war and saved the Union, and Lincoln was the central figure in that, in that, um, that um, overgeneralization of what occurred in the Civil War. And it was very effective for the Republicans. They won most of the elections. And Lincoln became a very elevated figure. He was put on the tops of tall columns, um, like in Washington, D.C. And, and elsewhere, statues uh, started going up. Augustus St. Gaudens contributed in 1887 the Standing Lincoln that uh, is down in uh, Lincoln Park now. And for the uh, centennial, you had another Republican administration, Teddy Roosevelt uh, in uh, in the White House, and he was very interested in continuing to promulgate this this Lincoln Association and this Lincoln uh, imagery of, of greatness. And Lincoln was um, a very uh, was a favorite was a favorite ideal of, of Teddy Roosevelt's. In, I have a uh, an image of the Teddy Roosevelt uh, White House office, and when he's sitting at his desk. On the se it was on the second floor then. That was before the Oval Office. He had a he had an image of Abraham Lincoln straight in front of him. So every time he sat at his desk, Lincoln was looking straight on him. And in uh, 1909, he decided that it'd be really good to put a little amulet in the hands of everybody, attesting to Lincoln's greatness. He convinced Victor David Brenner to design a scent, and of course we have the Lincoln scent. This is kind of small, but we'll show it. Yeah, Vic, you want me to talk about that? Yeah, if you want to say a little bit about Brenner. I mean, you're right there in 1909. I'm just showing it. Right. Why don't we keep going through the, that the was periods. the Lincoln, the ideal, okay. uh, then the idol that we're going to get into now. Okay, so in 1909 to 1959 was the time of the greatest Lincoln myth building. He, we built the uh, his Greek temple on the National Mall. Uh, we put him in the Pantheon in the Black Hills. Dozens and dozens of Lincoln statues went up hither, thither, and yon, just about everywhere. And I'm, even today, I'm learning of new ones that I don't know of. Um, it was a time of the Lincoln cent circulating, and it was a time of the Lincoln $5 bill circulating, and it was the time of motion pictures. Motion pictures did a lot to contribute to Lincoln's imagery during the period 1909 to 1959. Dozens and dozens of depictions in movies uh, of Lincoln, generally as, as a kind of benevolent, um, savior of the race kind of kind of imagery um, until uh, up till 1959 when it culminated in a in a sesquicentennial observance of Lincoln. Of course, they changed the image on the back of the set to commemorate it, and then we had the civil rights era and the and the um, uh, sesquicentennial of the Civil War celebration, where Lincoln was just in the forefront all over again. Another another wave of people people like me. That's where I met up with Lincoln, basically, during the Civil War centennial, who became very enamored um, of his legacy, very admiring of him as a man and his principles, very um, appreciative of his accomplishments, and very uh, convinced of his doctrines, I guess you could say. I'm a true believer, for the most part, uh, up until 2009. But by 2009, the Lincoln consciousness that I knew where Abraham Lincoln was on the front of every schoolroom where that image of Washington and Lincoln were up there on the blackboard, where um, Lincoln uh, was a, a revered figure set, on, set in stone and set in bronze on top of large columns and, and large pediments and statues. Um, it's a new age now. We, we have the internet, we have all kinds of other distractions, and Abraham's Lincoln image has changed. He is immortal, but he's no longer the Abe Lincoln who was the father of his, uh, uh, of his uh, of the reborn country or the savior of 
the reborn country or the emancipator of a race. He now is a, uh, a silly cartoon figure that you stick in on comic books, that you make into uh, uh, a ridiculous figure in, in cartoons and advertisements and other, and other really misrepresentations of who Lincoln was, at least the Lincoln I grew to know and love, the historical Lincoln.